You're listening to The Weather Junkies. Oh, boy. Large wedge tornado coming up in two hours. A winter storm warning is in effect for our area. We can expect at least another two to four inches for the night. The National Weather Service in Huntsville has issued a tornado warning for Northwestern Madison. Good Thursday evening, and thank you for joining us here on The Weather Junkies. I'm Tyler Jankowski here in Connecticut, joined alongside Dakota Smith in Colorado. Dakota? Good evening, everyone. Uh, out in Fort Collins, Colorado, we got about an inch of snow on the ground, and it's still, I think it's lightly snowing now. A uh, stark difference from last week, and even a stark difference from yesterday, where we basically hit 80 degrees, um, and now we're sitting just below freezing with a nice uh, nice wet one and a half, two inches on the ground. Um, that's pretty much what the entire front range saw. Denver saw a little less um, than Fort Collins and Boulder, but uh, it's pretty fun. First snow of the year, one of the later snows of the year. I think it was the third latest uh, accumulating snowfall for Denver and the second or third for Fort Collins. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit in the tweets. Tyler, how is the weather in Bristol? It's very good. Um, we had more than an inch of rain in western Connecticut on Tuesday. My weather station here says like four-tenths of an inch, but I've seen a lot of other observations of an inch or more, so I'm not sure if I need to look into that or not. But uh, today, the Drought Center issued their update, and the big buzz here in southern New England was that the extreme drought was expanded far to the south and west so almost half of connecticut now in the extreme drought also portions of the hudson valley in the catskills but the drought updates as you may know are issued on a weekly basis and the the analysis of the data ends at 7 a.m on tuesday so not that it'll have a big impact but none of the rain that we saw on tuesday was included in the update so I don't think it would have a major impact because it's only one inch and we average about an inch a week. But I think maybe the extreme drought would have been held off for a week or two if, if they had included that rain. But um, the, the big trend of dry weather is going to continue, I think, for a while, at least for the next week or two. And um, while the one inch is helpful, it's nothing when you look at the 20-inch deficit that we have dating back to May of 2015. And so... A lot of the uh, talk today was about reservoirs and, and where people are standing in terms of the drought. I know I in Bristol, I talked to the superintendent of the water department on Monday, and he said that the reservoirs in town are at 42%, 42%. They were at 50 a month ago. So in a month's time, they've gone down by 8% which is quite a lot. I, I know a lot of other places are up near like 60 or 70. So we're, we're a city of 60,000 here. And um, I, I, it's a guess, but I don't think the, the water system has changed much in the last hundred years. So it'll be interesting here over the next couple of months. Hmm. Yeah, we, our drought actually got upgraded uh, this week as well. I think, I think in Fort Collins or just south of Fort Collins, we're in a severe drought now. Uh, we got our first accumulated precip in a really long time here today. Um, and it doesn't, it's same thing for, for here. It doesn't really look like we're going to get that much more, at least in the next week, next week or so. Um, and that's really hurting the, uh, a lot of the ski places out here. Not only is it warm, but it's not really snowing that much up there. It, um, it'll be interesting to see how much of an impact this has on snowmaking. But last year in the Northeast, the big thing was the warmth. This year, who knows, it may be the warmth, but it could also be drought and lack of water, which would be a killer. Yeah. Yeah, drought, drought seems to be a problem right now for a couple places, including the southeast. And we're actually joined by someone from the southeast tonight uh, in Sean Milrad. Uh, he's in Daytona Beach at Embry-Riddle. Uh, Sean got his uh, bachelor's degree in atmospheric science from Cornell uh, and then he went to McGill University in Montreal um, to get his master's and PhD in atmospheric and oceanic sciences. Uh, and now he is a uh, professor down at Embry-Riddle, doing a lot of teaching, 
um, and some research down there. Sean, thanks for joining us tonight, and how's the weather? Yeah, thanks guys for having me on. Um, pleased to be here. Um, the weather is uh, about as perfect for Florida as you can get. It's, uh, it's about 60 degrees right now. It was in the mid-70s today, and um, actually with the, when the next trough passes on Saturday night, they're, uh, they're forecasting us not to get out of the 60s on Sunday, which um, down here is gener generally referred to as parka and uh, chilly weather. So um, I've already seen people planning t chili recipes and uh, what heavy jacket they're going to wear um, on Sunday. So that's, um, we're kind of south of the drought with there. Uh, I know Alabama and Georgia and um, Western North Carolina have had fires and um, are in exceptional drought, but we we're really sitting around normal. Obviously the hurricane uh, probably helped with that earlier in the fall, but um, that's can't really complain this week. That's for sure. Yeah, it's, do you like having the? I don't know. I I would I would feel weird without not having like a like a, a real winter, as like a snow guy. Is that does that bother you or does are you not that big of a snow person? Yeah, I mean I'm from the Northeast. So I I do miss um, I do miss seeing snow and I do miss the, I miss fall more than anything. I mean we don't yeah. like it'll it'll get. I guess our winter is probably what most people in the mid latitudes consider sort of early to mid fall but we don't get uh you know the changing of the leaves and that the sort of the, the fall feeling during all uh, halloween and apple picking and all that stuff so that that stuff i miss more than the snow um but i i miss snow one you know seeing snow i don't miss shoveling it quite as much but <laughs> yeah it becomes kind of a nuisance sometimes yeah um, and there there are some perks to wearing in November on occasion yeah, so definitely um, so we'll get back with Sean uh, to talk about teaching and earth sciences uh, as our topic tonight uh, but first let's talk about some of the things that was trending in the weather enterprise this week uh, I'll start off with the first tweet tonight uh, from Josh Josh Larson Larson uh, he's a writer uh, for weather 5 to 80 and he tweeted to put that in perspective, today's high low of 80 and 57 in Denver compared to the normal high low 50 and 24. So basically what this is saying, this, is, this was yesterday, and our high was this in Denver was 80 when the normal was 52, and the low was 57 when the normal low is 24. Uh, that 80 degrees broke the record temperature for any no any, any uh, November day, record high temperature for any November day in Denver. Um, so, and, and a lot of records were broken across um, some of the Southern Plains and Front Range. And now we're dealing with snow. Uh, you know, everyone says if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. Um, that's true in a lot of places, also in Denver, um, where we see these swings like that. Isn't this a tumultuous time time of year? Aren't you used to going from snow to sun and warmth? Yes. And this is an extreme case of that. I, I, yeah, I'd say we're used to it, and yeah, this is one of the extreme cases. And I, I actually like winters out here because you have a big snowstorm go through, and then I don't know, two days later, it gets into the fifties and it's sunny, so it doesn't feel that bad out. Um, yeah. So, but it came a lot later. This is. You know, first snowfall of the year, it's, it's, um, it's pretty late for out here. Our next tweet comes from Brian. He's on Twitter at Climatologist49. He's an Alaskan, and his tweet is a photo of a moose in um, what looks like a yard next to a Davis weather station. Current observation in Midtown Anchorage, partly cloudy, 21, big effing moose. <laughs> um, what would that be in a meat I bar? <laughs> I actually saw someone uh, pretend to write it up in a meat bar. Shoot, Hold I wish on, I had, had a tweet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's have you guys ever? Word. Have you guys ever seen the Canadian meat bar that says uh, "clouds"? Cloud to the north looks like a puppy. That's a real Canadian meat bar. Wow, I've never seen that. Ago. Yeah, that's some so of the cool. northern, uh, the northern. Can, Northern Ontario, in particular, they uh, they have some interesting um, observations when the weather is boring and it's cold and dark and 
Um, <laughs> Got to entertain somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that tweet, Brian. Uh, he he tweets a lot of really you know very in informational stuff. Um, and of course, we picked this one with the big moose in it. Um, <laughs> we'll move on to our next tweet uh, from Zach Laib. He's a we, we we share a lot of stuff on here a lot. You can follow him at Zlaib. Uh, he's a student right now, doing uh, a lot of. I, I think he's doing a lot of climate research. Uh, we had him on the show in the summer. Uh, his tweet says, "This is not normal global sea ice area," and then it shows a figure of the. Uh, global sea ice area for every year since 1978 over the course of that year. Um, and then he shows this year in a red line. And we are at a time low uh, for this time of the year for a global sea ice area. Um, and it's not even an all time low. It is just, it, it, what is it? The scale, it's, I mean, it's markedly lower than any other um, any other time of the year uh, or, or any other year for this time of the year. Um, Tyler, I know you had a few thoughts on this. I retweeted it. I thought it was a great way to present the information. You see oftentimes with climate stuff, a line that goes away from other lines. But this one struck me as very different. Um, do you know which pole is the biggest or the bigger contributor to this anomaly? I actually don't, but I know they both are. Uh, yeah, they're both included, which is which is good. Um, For the time of the year, I don't know. I want to say it's the Arctic um, because it, uh, you know, went through a bunch of melting in the summer, and now uh, it's it's starting to refreeze. But I. I don't know. I, I I would I would think it's the Arctic. I don't know. You, you could probably scroll through a few of his tweets and uh, and find. Yeah, out. I think, he's I think they're both at. Um, they're both at. Uh, sorry to cut you off. They're both at um, minimum for minima for the day. I I thought he tweet tweeted that um, both the Arctic and Antarctic are at minima for the for the date, um, which yeah, I is think I think right about that. yeah why it's highly unusual. Um, and we don't have it included as a tweet, but I think he or someone else tweeted a temperature line for um, maybe the North Pole and, and how it's just like jutting off to the right instead of going down. Hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah. So it definitely um, coincides with less ice. It may okay, so I have his uh, sea ice departure uh, plot up here. And it shows the total anomaly and the Arctic and Antarctic total ano or anomaly. And they're actually about the same. Um, they're both at negative 2 million square kilometers. I think I'm reading that right. And see ice extent. Um, so they're actually equally contributing to this. Um, so interesting. I, interesting and kind of a... You know, shocking. Oh, I see a tweet here about the temperature where uh, what looks like the climatology line continues to go down and the, the observed line is just pretty much constant. In the last, in the most recent observations, it's actually rising. I wonder what this ice anomaly, what type of impact it'll have on uh, the, the United States winter, if any. Yeah, I'm not smart enough. Well, I saw no. that I saw there was a temperature, uh, a story from the weather, the Capital Weather Gang about the alarming temperature anomaly up there. Uh, over yeah, there. I saw that. So uh, yeah. it'll be interesting. I mean, last winter was was terrible here for ski areas. We had it was the warmest winter on record in in December. I was just looking at the stat today. <laughs> the warmest December by like five degrees over number two. So if we have another winter that's quite a ways above average it'll be a, a disaster for the ski areas anyways that's a that's an extended uh twitter discussion i take this last one away tyler yeah um goes are we've been talking about it for a few months had a little bit of a hiccup there with with matthew and this tweet is not just a tweet about when the satellite launches it's actually from the space flight account of the weather service 
And the tweet says the United States Air Force 45th Weather Squadron is giving a 90% go forecast for goes are on Saturday. And if you actually click the link, they have a PDF prepared of the forecast, even a phone number for the launch weather team. But basically they talk about high pressure persisting over central Florida, favorable weather. They have all sorts of good stats and the uh, the forecast is valid from 5:42 to 6:42 Saturday evening. So they have a an hour window that they've issued this forecast for, and it, it looks like the satellite's going to launch somewhere in that window. I would think. Yeah, I think it's supposed to go up at 5:42 is the planned, um, but it okay. looks like the 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 cold front will hold off until late Saturday night. So I think I think it should be. I mean, normally when they launch from uh, Cape Canaveral, we we here in Daytona can see the launch. It looks like kind of just a streak in the sky. But I know, um, like our our student AMS group is driving down to um, oh the next town over Cocoa Beach, basically, and and going planning to view it. So it seems like unless there's a technical glitch, it should be a go. It's time to get the long exposure camera shots ready to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. I know I shouldn't be, but I am so nervous for this launch just with how 2016 <laughs> is gone as a year. <laughs> I'm, well, I that's I'm why probably... it doesn't need a number until it's up there. Yeah, yeah. I Everyone was freaking out here. Oh, yeah. Everything was freaking out here when the hurricane passed because they were afraid it was going to uh, damage because the, the eye passed within, oh, 25 miles of, of uh, Kennedy Space Center. But yeah, they had it in a bunker somewhere. Well, that's, yeah, I was glad nothing happened then. We're actually having a viewing party here because there's a group that has worked a lot on it. And yeah, I'm probably 10 times, 100 times less nervous than any of those people who have spent, you know, hours and hours of their time building this thing, but it should all go according to plan, uh, knock on wood. Um, so that'll do it for uh, the Twitter segment this week. And uh, let's let's dive right into it with our chat with Sean here. Uh, so Sean, I guess just to start off, what what kind of led you to where you are now? How did you get into to weather and how did you get into teaching um, meteorology? Um. Good questions. Uh, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> um, whether I, I actually originally wanted to be uh, an astronomer, um, and then in high school, uh, well, there are two things. First of all, the the blizzard of '96. Uh, I was uh, I was a sophomore in high school, um, and uh, lived in Central Jersey, um, and that that had a big impact. It, on me, I just couldn't stop watching the Weather Channel. I think a lot of meteorology majors have similar stories, but um, that sort of school was closed for three days, and um, I just became fascinated by it, and uh, you know, started to really think of look into universities where where they had it as a major. So that that was really the what got me into weather. Um, teaching is a more long winded uh, story. I. Uh, I was definitely, when I was at Cornell, I definitely knew I wanted to go to grad school, um, but I actually took a year off after Cornell because I, uh, mostly it was just burnout. I, I needed a a breather uh, before I went to grad school. Um, so I deferred for a year. Um, and then when I eventually, long story short, when I um, finished my PhD, I swore I'd never go into academia um, because I was tired of it. <laughs> So I worked in the private sector for, um, oh gosh, it wasn't even that long. It was maybe six months. Um, and I didn't like the fact that I was just sitting at a computer programming all the time. Um, and by then the sort of the exhaustion from academia had worn off and um, a job opened up late uh, at the University of Kansas. They were looking for a, a two year contract, basically a, a fill in. Um, they called it a visiting assistant professor. So I applied on a whim and actually got it. I, I moved out to Kansas within three weeks um, and got there about a week before the semester started. And uh, that's how I got into it and eventually um, ended up here uh, in, starting in 2013 at, uh, 
in a tenure track position. So that's that's the short version of the story. So I have I have so many questions about that because I'm kind of at that moment in my life where I'm like, you know, what the heck am I going to do? Academia is kind of crazy, uh, but I'll save that for the the post show chat here. Um, so <laughs> as you I guess have moved from from Kansas and now to Embry Riddle as a as a teacher, uh, what what are some of the what are the, some of the things that you've learned about teaching, uh, whether it's specific to meteorology or not specific to meteorology, that's kind of super important for, for you to do as a teacher? Um, the biggest, well, there's a couple things. It, um, it really depends what you're teaching. So there's a, a huge difference between teaching, say, an intro weather class, um, which tend to be of bigger size, and um, you have a lot of people in there who aren't uh, meteorology or atmospheric science majors. And then, so there's a difference between that and teaching more advanced classes. For the, for the intro classes, the, the biggest thing I ever learned um, was from really the person who taught me how to teach. Uh, he was a postdoc at McGill while I was a student, um, and I was his TA for a lot of years. Um, and he said that, the thing you have to remember when you're teaching intro classes is it's half teaching, half circus entertainment. Um, so, so <laughs> that's um, when I teach an intro class. I mean, you you can't PowerPoint them to death, right? Uh, they students will even write, you know, in some uh, end of semester feedback, death by PowerPoint. You're always going to get a few few of those, but uh, I think the big, the best advice I have is really to mix it up and um you know we have some tools here where they you can actually uh they're called clickers there's different varieties of them but you can actually put questions on the screen and have students um use these electronic clickers to respond to them and that keeps them engaged um, i do a bunch of labs i we do a lab on the roof an observation lab um, where we actually take weather instruments up to the roof and um, they they take measurements that that's pretty popular and to be honest with you a lot of times i'll just break up a lecture um, especially in an intro class by um, showing a funny video usually of a tv meteorologist saying or doing something funny the cantori thunder snow videos are very popular um, so that's uh that's a lot what I do with the intro class. With the with the more advanced classes or even with grad classes, I think my number one rule, and I think it's easier just because I'm, uh, my synoptics is my focus. So I think it's easier with things like that. But my number one rule is to just um, use real time weather as much as I can. You know, don't don't uh, you know schematics and historical examples are useful, but making sure that that people are uh, aware of the real-time weather and also making students present it to you. So like in my advanced forecasting class, um, I have, after the first week, they do all the weather discussions and they take turns and, you know, it's usually, it's one group per, per class, but it's a lot more useful for them, I think, than uh, listening to me go on and on uh, about the weather. So that that's, those are the main things I think I've learned over the years. And also you, you get better uh, with repetition. Um, but at, by the same time, you know, you teach a class more than once helps, but by the same token, you don't want it to get stale. So it's a balance between um, sort of improving with repetition, but also making sure your materials stay up to date and current and incorporate new findings and things like that. I'm curious if you were to look back on the first lecture you ever gave uh, as a as a as a associate professor or assistant professor, uh, what, what would you would, would anything stand out to you that maybe you weren't doing at the time that that you now have kind of taken on as a philosophy? I, well, first of all, I was a nervous wreck. Um, in fact, it's still kind of a joke among uh, students from Kansas who are in that class about how how nervous I was that day. Um, but I would say the number one thing um, is involve the students more, even if it was a lecture. Um, like, for example, I think that was METAR code. There's 
you know, you can't really give a discussion on METAR code, but at least um, break it up and show real-time examples and, uh, you know, make students come up and write a METAR code on the board as they get more comfortable with it or things like that. So um, involve the students more, make it more interactive, even if it is a lecture and a discussion class. I think that's the, the main takeaway. Gotcha. And we, on Twitter, someone, uh, I don't, I'm going to butcher the name, but Cor Corialis, Cor Corales? Um, oh, correct, Corales, yeah. yeah. Corales, she, yeah, she tweeted and said you were definitely important for me. Uh, she, was, she was talking to you, so that's, that's really cool to see that you have this kind of lasting yeah, that, impact on. That's, um, I mean, honestly, that, that, that type of stuff keeps me going in the job. Um, it's, it's always good to hear from uh, students, whether current or alumni. I mean, she graduated in the, in the spring and now is working on her master's in, I think, journalism. But, um, but it's always cool to hear from students who moved on to whether it's grad school or jobs in various sectors and, and things like that and um, hear that you, you know, they learned something or that you made an impact. That's, uh, I think that was another reason I, I really, after the grad school hangover wore off, that I was really uh, interested in going back to and staying in academia. It's, uh, there's more interaction than I found there was in the private sector and there's more of a well, at least in my opinion, a more, more of a lasting impact. Um, but I, I really appreciate the sort of getting to interact with people on a daily basis and, you know, um, in some cases, keeping those connections for, for a long time. Yeah, I, I, it's always cool to see that. And Tyler and I have a, had a professor, uh, John Neese, who kind of did that for us. And uh, I, I, I won't speak for Tyler, but if, if he wasn't there as a teacher, I... I mean, I don't know how, I learned so much from him, and he taught us, I think, three classes, and just in those three classes, I probably learned um, more in, in those three classes than any of my other classes, because he was such a good teacher, and he he really, he knew how to engage you, and he, he was very, um, he knew the science, too, which is a, a big part of it. Um, it was like the concrete foundation. Uh, the What's concrete that? foundation. I still have uh, the the labs in the uh, the exams, and I haven't looked at them in a while. I might actually try to do one in a few weeks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> memories. What I remember is a lot of people didn't really look forward to them, but I was always confident that if you if you made sense of everything and you thought things through, that you could get the answer right. And and the best thing about his questions was. You know, he, he would always try to make sure that it wasn't an easy question, but it was one that made you think. Um, if you could think through things, you'd get it right. And I still right. use those, those skills to this day. And they're very, very applicable, I feel like. It was like, oh, okay, this is a situation that I've seen before on like a, I don't know, a satellite imagery or a radar or something. And... Uh, I, I, when something when you can when you can apply something to to what's actually happening and what you've seen before, I I, I think you learn a lot. At least I, I learned a lot from those kind of. And, and probably I'm laughing because I remember we'd review the exams. He would be honestly upset if the average was below a certain number, <laughs> as if the teaching yeah. wasn't getting through. I I kind of get like that too. Yeah, I guess to be honest. I, yeah, and it, I don't, if the average is sort of atypical for what I've had in the past, I I question, I don't really question the students, I question myself. Um, and I'm, it's it's more like, what did, what did I not do this year? Or what did I not do correctly um, this year uh, compared to previous years? So I, I can totally vouch for that. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's refreshing to hear because, I don't know, not not everyone's like that. and. I think it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you you also do some research down there. I I presume I, yeah. I saw that 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 you mentioned a, a little bit. I guess how much how much time? What, what's the time uh, allocation for that? Because what what I saw in 
in, in undergrad was the time people, people, the teachers were, were definitely not spending as much time on teaching uh, than would have been good for the students. Uh, but that's just kind of how academia is sometimes. How, how do you balance those two things? Right, that's an excellent question, not, not an easy answer. It really depends on where you are. Um, I mean, certainly when I was in grad school, and, and McGill's kind of a, a mid-sized program, um, but you know, the, the professors were primarily um, research focused a lot. A number of classes were taught by postdocs or research associates. Um, they weren't taught by professors. The course load at most, um, for a professor at most research based institutions um, is usually no more than three courses a year. Um, some of them are just one per semester. So um, now where I am now, it's it's essentially the opposite. Um, we, we're traditionally a, a teaching focused institution. And also our meteorology program is undergraduate only. Um, so it, we can spend more time on on teaching and also on undergraduates. Um, by the same token, our our course load is three per semester, which is yeah, is high. I mean, uh, there aren't that many who have that high. So finding time to do research is is difficult um, in a place like where I am now. Um, I mean, I managed to do it, but I certainly don't do as much of it um, as I would uh, a at a more research focused institution and be if we had a graduate program. So um, there are opportunities to go both ways. Uh, and there are there there are some schools that are middle ground. Um, when you but when you generally think of the big meteorology programs, um, you know, yeah. Colorado State, Washington, Wisconsin, those those type of programs, it's generally research focused and, and te teaching is a, a secondary concern. Um, but it really, I, the biggest factor is, is where you go and what the priority of the university and the department are. So what kind of classes do you teach? So we have, because uh, we're a, an aeronautical university, so we're actually the, I think, we're still the, the leading aerospace um, institution in the country. So everyone who comes here um, to be a pilot, a professional pilot, they have to take two weather classes. Um, so those are our service courses. So they have to take introductory meteorology, which I teach usually in the fall. And then they have to take um, intro to aviation weather, um, which is I usually teach in the spring. Um, and then we have our own meteorology majors. So among, for those people, I teach uh, sort of an intro analysis and forecasting class where they, we learn how to isopleth and um, draw station plots and uh, skew T's and things like that. And then I teach advanced uh, synoptic and uh, forecasting. And that that's the class I was kind of referring to earlier where they they basically give their own weather discussions uh, every time we meet and also we we do some theory as well so we do um qg theory and potential vorticity and, and things like that so it's that one's kind of a mix but um i've taught uh i, I recently started teaching a climate dynamics class which we just added to the curriculum um uh, i think it'll be every other spring um and i've also taught our thunderstorms class. Uh, and then last summer, we added a storm chasing class, which we're not allowed to call it storm chasing because the university lawyers get upset. Um, <laughs> but it's basically, it's basically uh, a lot of universities do it. I, I know University of Illinois and College of DuPage have done it forever. Um, but we took nine students um, for two weeks out to the plains. And um, it was a three credit class. and. Um, they had to do research projects when they got back, but we we saw we were there like for the Dodge City tornadoes on uh, in late May, and um, that whole week where we basically chased. We, we were fortunate last last summer, so I like teaching new new different classes. Um, but that's that's sort of the recap of what I teach here. 
yeah, I'd say getting lucky for that. I guess it's not luck, but that, that's a really nice week to, to be out there uh, this summer. Um, yeah, they they were uh, – I, I sort of had this reputation as being a tornado curse uh, before that. So um, there, there had been several big events when I lived in Kansas that I – either couldn't go or went to the wrong place for, for various reasons. Um, but that uh, last summer group was the curse. <laughs> the curse has been lifted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, I, I guess, how, taking a, a group of students out chasing, are you, I, I, I would feel so much responsibility and, and that would, I don't know, that, that seems kind of scary to, to have that much responsibility. What What is it like to take a group out uh, chasing like that? Uh, what you said. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have to be, uh, you have to be careful. You have to be safety first. It's, it's, I mean, I'm generally a pretty cautious chaser to begin with. So I don't think it was a huge adjustment for me, but um, you know, you have to sort of uh, make the rules clear. Um, and make sure that you're, you always have an escape route, right? I mean, the number one goal is to survive. It's not to see the tornado. Um, and it's to keep everyone in one piece. Um, like that Dodge City day, I mean, there, obviously, I'm sure you guys know it's become so popular that you, have, you get into these with chaser traffic jams and stuff like that. But, I mean, there were, there were cars... Uh, flying by us, you know, while we were pulled over on a side road and they had red and blue flashing lights and they weren't police. They were just chasers who sort of were pretending to be police. They could get ahead. So it's, yeah, it's become, a, it's changed a lot since I first started doing it. And that's not that long ago. It's only 10 years ago, but um, it's changed a lot. And how many people think they can do it um, and kind of do it by themselves and it's a race to get the best pictures, but, but with a class that really the, in addition to staying safe, I mean, you want them to feel like they helped forecast for the right spot, right? So that's almost as big of an achievement as actually seeing the storm. So I think that's, that's something we also try to keep in mind um, is, you know, making sure they feel involved in the decision making. But yeah, it is. It is a big. It, it's a. It's a stressor. You you worry about safety, and you're always you know sort of keeping the back of your mind. Well, what do I, what's the scariest situation I can get into today, and how do I get out of it? Basically, is what you try to remember. How important is that uh, that hands on experience and actually seeing the storm and forecasting the storm that you saw? How important is that to to their education? I think it's invaluable. I mean, we, we've done it, so we did it with that, and then we also had the Doppler on wheels here the previous summer um, for two weeks, um, studying local convection. Uh, and it was, I mean, obviously it wasn't super cellular, but it was the same idea, you, you forecast and you position your the radar and then you measure the data as, I mean, there've been a lot of social science studies that have shown sort of this hands-on experiential learning is, um, really advantageous and also it gives them a, a leg up um, on a, if they wanna be a forecaster, it gives them a leg up on a job application. And also if they wanna do grad school, um, you know, it says you were involved with certain things uh, while you were an undergrad that were different. So I think it, uh, it, it helps a lot. And I, I think all of them last year, uh, even the ones who we actually had two who were who weren't meteorology majors, they were uh, aeronautical science majors, uh, but meteorology minors, and I think they all learned a lot um, on how to forecast, what to look for, and also you can't replicate the visual cues for a severe storm in the classroom, right? I mean, seeing the the striations in the supercell and the the wall cloud and um, the mammatus, you can't replicate that. So I think it's uh, it's hugely advantageous. Um, in fact, it's to the point now where we're, we're going to offer it every year and, and we're getting pretty high demand for it. So, um, yeah, I think every, if every school did it, it would be a, a boon to their enrollments and to the, the undergraduate and graduate experience. 
So you're based in Daytona Beach. What was Hurricane Matthew like? <laughs> I escaped to Atlanta. Um, <laughs> it, it was uh, it was dicey. Um, I uh, I eva- I personally have accurate, but but school wise, it was it was very dicey. Our biggest, in addition to getting students out, we have a, a giant fleet of aircraft because um, you know we have students who get their certifications and stuff. So we, we have about 40 aircraft and they had to fly all of those out. I think they flew them to Auburn, Alabama um, and house them there. Um, and then there was the question of, of students who didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, they, they ended up being put in, uh, in county shelters. And so it was a, it was a dicey situation. And the, the storm, I mean, it was a cat four, but the, the winds, the Cat 3, Cat 4 winds really only extended out about 40 to 50 miles. Uh, so it was, you know, the models kept bouncing back and forth between making landfall and not making landfall. And uh, despite the NHC con- uh, continuity, um, a lot of people these days go on one or two model runs and, you know, will freak out or not freak out depending upon what they say. So it, it was a dicey few a uh, few days um, in, in the in retrospect I mean this area wasn't hit that hard it was power was the biggest issue it was out for uh, two days ish um, in most places the some areas to the north um, St. Augustine saw a lot of surge flooding at high tide and then of course there was the, the flooding in North Carolina which I think ended up being the worst damage in the, the whole storm but um, this is not we, People think of Florida as hurricane country, but this is not a part of Florida that, that sees a lot of hurricanes. The, the fact that the coast kind of bends inward towards the Northwest uh, has protected this area for a long time. So it was an unusual event, that's, that's for sure. And you've only been there since 2013, so you haven't yeah. really had to deal with that many storms. I, and you're, you know, you're not in the, there are a lot of people down there that are, it's the same situation, even, even if they've been there for five plus years. Do you see, um, did you see with, with Matthew people not really knowing how to respond or did, did, did people generally take the right precautions? Um, I would say more took the right precautions than not, but there, there is a big problem in Florida um, having not had a major landfall since 2005 um, where we have a, um, a huge migration of people moving moving down here um, who've never experienced a, a strong hurricane. Um, so there were a lot of people who definitely stuck it out and probably got lucky and that the, the worst of it remained offshore. Um, but in a different situation, it, it would have been exponentially worse. So I think uh, education and um, you know, keeping people aware and making sure they, they trust the right outlets, uh, in, especially in this day and age of information coming at you from everywhere is important. Uh, but there is, yeah, there is definitely a large segment that, that don't take it seriously because they've, they've never really experienced it because it's been such a drought for U.S. landfalls. So each week we ask our guest the same question at the end of the show. And uh, you should have a very good answer given that you're a, a meteorologist and you, and you teach students and you seem to enjoy it. And the question is for people that may be considering studying meteorology or for those that are already studying meteorology, what would your advice be to them? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, number one thing um, is diversify yourself. Um, and what I mean by that is whether you're an undergraduate or graduate, um, try to be, at least become acquainted with as many tools and subfields uh, of meteorology as you can. Um, so like for students who are undergraduates in our program, we, we, sh- we had minors in things like emergency management and GIS. Um, try to acquire skills that make you stand out. 
Um, and that can be more than one skill. Um, but it's not just about forecasting is sort of the thing that, you know, machines are replacing people pretty rapidly in forecasting. Um, but there are other subfields, whether it's risk management or um, emergency management, GIS, mapping, um, reinsurance. There are other things, climate obviously is a big one, where you can make yourself stand out. And the, the more you do that um, and the earlier you start, the better. Um, and along with that goes internships. Uh, don't just focus on your GPA um, or your on campus, sort of your extracurricular on campus thing. A lot of students, and, and that stuff is great. It, it, it does look good on application. Um, making sure you get professional experience through an internship, whether it's broadcast or private or government, whatever it is, um, is important. Um, you know, so it, whatever you want to do, start early um, and get as much diverse experience as, as you can. I know that was one thing I regretted in hindsight was sort of limiting myself to um, synoptics. And it was, I've honestly learned a lot more teaching um, than as a student. If I, that might sound strange, but that's that's kind of how it went for me. So I, I encourage people to sort of get as much experience as they can as early as they can. And diversify and acquire skills that make you stand out. Uh, some spot on advice there, Sean. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, we hope to have you back on sometime in the future. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much for having me. I, I uh, had a blast. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for listening tonight. If you're not already following us on Twitter or Facebook, you can follow us at the WX Junkies. You can listen to this podcast on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes. If you're over on iTunes, go ahead and give us a rating or review. We'd really appreciate it. And Tyler, we don't have a show next week, but what can we expect in the future weeks? Next week's Thanksgiving, so we decided we'd uh, take a, a week off, and we hope that you uh, will accept that. I can't remember the last time we had a week off, but uh, our next show will be in two weeks, and that'll be December 1st on a Thursday. And uh, so it's two weeks away. And do we have a guest for that show, Dakota? I don't think so, but uh, one thing that, that will be coming in the future is we're going to do a collaboration with uh, Weather Hype, um, uh, Min and Castle, who run Weather Hype. Uh, we're going to be on their show, and then they're going to come on our show sometime in December. So it could be the next show, um, but but at least before the next year, uh, we'll we'll be collaborating with them. And also something to note: we've been on, we've been doing this podcast for a year now. Uh, November marks the the year. Um, oh, do you have the, done... the exact date? No, I don't. It, it's we've done forty nine episodes, um, and I think we only took off. Yeah, we only took off three weeks. Um, and so I think mid-November was like our one of our first shows. I don't know. You could look at look on uh, YouTube, I think, to to figure out the exact date. Uh, but actually, we, we took off more than three weeks, I think. But uh, um, well, we so have yeah, that's... four more shows in the year in December. I will be working on a few guests. Dakota will be working on a few guests, probably two each for the rest of 2016. So we're excited about that. Have a great Thanksgiving uh, with friends and family, and we'll see you back here on December 1st. So for Sean, Dakota, and myself, thank you for listening to this episode of The Weather Junkies, and we'll see you in two weeks.